Welcome to another edition of the Giants Little Podcast, brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the New York football giants. I am John Schmelk, friend of the program. He's been joining us every year for the past five, six years or so. Usually he's live from the combine. We decided to get him a little bit closer to the free agency this year to really break things down. Former agent, and now you can see his analysis on contracts at CBS Sports, Joe Corey. Joe, how are you? Doing great. How you doing? I'm doing great, Joe. It's good to talk to you. The Giants, let's start with their free agents first here. And I think the players and the markets at the positions are equally as interesting. So let's start out with Saquon. The Giants decide not to put a franchise tag on him for the second consecutive year. Now he enters a running back market that is extremely deep with former pro bowlers like Derrick Henry, Tony Pollard, Josh Jacobs, Austin Eckler, throwing guys like DeAndre Swift. Devin Singletary had a good year last year. So did Zach Moss. It's a flooded market. You get in on Saquon if you want. Just how do you think this whole running back for agency class is going to play out when that negotiating period begins on Monday at noon? Yeah, the economic conditions aren't great for running backs. If you look at it, first, supply and demand. You have supply exceeding what should be expected demand, never a good sign. Then, two, you had the market go backwards last year. You had eight running backs at $12 million per year more at the end of the 2022 season. You're probably going to have two. Um, now, uh, Nick Chubb will take a pay cut or get released. Alvin Kamara could take a pay cut or get released. You had Jonathan Taylor do the deal early during the season for $14 million a year. That's an anomaly. And you have Christian McCaffrey. Um, even the Packers, who have Aaron Jones making $11.5 million this year, have indicated that's too much for them. He ended the season with five 100-yard uh, games in a row, including the playoffs. So I don't like – the environment for running backs, but you have a higher caliber back than last year when Miles Sanders got the best deal in free agency at six point three five million per year. Um, if I'm Saquon, and I'm not upset with the Giants because that could be a very real possibility. And the reason I say that is when I represented free agents and you had that much acrimony or that much difficulty in getting a deal done. They were very likely to go, you know what, I'll go any place but here, unless the money is so overwhelming compared to every place else, I'm out. I don't know if he feels that way. Maybe he likes the New York market, wants to continue being a giant. I was surprised last year that he caved so quickly on the getting the incentives with the franchise tag, added to his franchise tag, unlike Josh Jacobs, who waited until he was good and ready to come in in the late latter part of the preseason. But – if he's okay with the Giants, that may be his best deal. I don't know in this environment. I try to get I try to get from the last offer I turned down and just call it a day. I don't know if any of these running backs get to ten million um, per year. He probably has the best bet. All of them have challenges based on last year. Josh Jacobs, the year was nothing like it was the year before. Um, Derrick Henry has different a set of circumstances. He was second in the league in rushing. Led the league in carries again, but he's 30, has over 2,000 career carries. So that's a warning sign, although he has some indications he may be an anomaly. Saquon wasn't the same year as in 2022, but the offensive line was terrible. Um, if you look at uh, Pro Football Focus's run blocking grades, the collectively the Giants were 30th. That's not good. So it's not like he's running. It's not like he was running behind an old Dallas Cowboys line like Ezekiel Elliott had, or if you go back even further, Emmitt Smith. But the running back market, uh, I wouldn't want to be one. Um, one, I wouldn't want to be one coming out in the draft, and there aren't any first round running backs. I wouldn't want to be one now, given how all the twelve million dollar pure running backs are, dis uh, are disappearing. So how quickly, Joel, do you think these guys are going to go off the board? Since you mentioned. Low demand, high quantity, right? So it's like a game of musical chairs where you got like eight guys and they're just walking around four chairs. So is this a deal where the first guy is going to jump at the first really good offer he gets? Do you think they're going to try to hold out and wait for a better deal? If you were advising your clients on how to approach this market in terms of timing, how would you advise them in terms of how you would handle this once you can start talking to teams on Monday? Well, technically the agents have some idea because that's one of the reasons you have the combine for the agent standpoint. One, you maybe sit your clients who are uh, going to be drafted, your draft eligible clients. It used to be, and it's going to come back next year. They'd have the 
agent seminar, you have to go to one seminar to remain in good standing as the NFLPA. They had a Zoom seminar this week. They got that technical difficulties a week before, so they didn't have it. They're going back in person next year. That's another reason for agents to go to the combine. And three is you get intel from your meetings with teams about your upcoming free agents. Technically, that's tampering. So agents should have an idea of what the market might be. So I'm going as soon as possible. Money will now the first wave of free agency is effectively over when free agency actually officially begins on the 13th because you have that two-day negotiating period. So basically all the deals for the first wave are done. And you don't typically see money go up in the second wave. Maybe you'll have a situation like uh, Odell Beckham Jr. last year where he was waiting and waiting and then inexplicably the Ravens gave him $15 million on a one-year deal when he didn't play the year before after a second ACL tear, didn't ask for any per-game roster bonuses where it could have made up to $18 million with incentives. He made a million in incentives, so it was sixteen. That's a rarity. Typically, the money does not get better for an unrestricted free agent, if you will, particularly in a position which isn't a premium one. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, let's shift over now, the safety position is similar, right? It's a position that... You haven't seen contracts going up necessarily. You know, Jesse Bates and Derwin James uh, are, are the two bigger ones that happened in the last couple of years. But last year, we saw a bunch of guys come in under 10. And we've seen, I forget the number, but more money has been shed at the safety position this offseason in terms of guys getting released this week than any other position. And it's not particularly close. So is this the same deal with the safeties? Are they staring down the same type of barrel of gun that the running backs are in terms of a market and the quantity of players on the market? Um, maybe not to the same degree, but it's not a strong group of safeties in the draft. There shouldn't be a first round safety. So you're not dealing with that, that dynamic. Whereas last year with the running backs, you had two go in the top 10, which is highly unusual. But yeah, I didn't see all these guys getting released. Um, I knew Jamal Adams was going to be gone. That The handwriting was on the wall. Maybe Kevin Byard, you kind of expected that one. Eddie Jackson, he's gone. Quandre Diggs, he's gone. And Justin Simmons, he's gone. So, yeah, you had uh, Adams was at $17.5 million per year. He was the third highest paid safety. Uh, you had Simmons, who was the fifth highest paid safety, a shade over 15. So that leaves Mika Fitzpatrick, who became the highest paid safety before Derwin James eclipsed him two years ago, and Jesse Bates, who signed for $16 million per year last year. Um, yeah, I think you yeah, have safeties potentially running the risk of overpricing themselves, particularly McKinney. Um, but he could be helped from the standpoint that Kyle Duggar has a transition tag on him, which could have a chilling effect because teams may think, I don't want to do New England's deal just because you can't do poison pills anymore. So in terms of matching, you can't really put anything to deter a team from matching outside of front loading the contract or just a gross overpay. And two, Antoine Winfield Jr. got a franchise tag. So McKinney's the best guy out there. I've seen reports he wants top five money. Uh, that's now come down compared to what it was three days ago. He also has a, an agent who's basically the safety guru, David Mulgetta, because he represents um, Derwin James, for one. Um, Buda Baker, who, who one time was the highest paid safety, who, who now goes back into the top five. He represents Jesse Bates as well, Kevin Byard. Quandre Diggs. So this guy knows the safety market. Um, he's probably going to be looking at Jesse Bates money and trying to get it. What you target and what you get are two different things. So I'm targeting Jesse Bates money, um, 16 million a year, 36 million in, uh, in guarantees is one thing. Getting it could be a different story. Now, the floor should be Grant Delphit because Xavier McKinney is better than Grant Delphit. Grant Delphit was injured and towards the end of the season, Regular season signed for twelve million per year. Thirty uh, three years, thirty six million was the extension. I think like twenty five million overall guarantees, maybe fourteen fully guaranteed at signing. But yeah, that should be the floor. Got it. All right. And the reason I ask you this question is if you listen to our interview with Joel last year from the combine. He nailed the Daniel Jones contract almost to the dollar in the guarantees. And he nailed the Andrew Thomas and Dexter Lawrence extensions, which we talked about on that on that interview. So ballpark for me or give me what you think the final numbers for both Barkley and McKinney will be, regardless of where they wind up. Oh, uh, wow. 
they're they're harder than last year. I had more certainty because those positions were more premium positions. Barkley could be anywhere. It's not going to be below Miles Sanders. If he's trying to get – all it takes is one team, though. You get one team that thinks he can put him over the hump, like maybe Philadelphia, although they could just run it back with DeAndre Swift. Um, maybe they think he can get them back to where they needed to be. Dallas, although Tony Pollard said he'd come back on a hometown discount, I'd upgrade. The Ravens, if you put Saquon there, that's a different dimension. But – if he can get over $10 million per year, that's a win, and given the running back climate. Um, I'm still thinking McKinney gets paid. Maybe he's at $15 million per year, and the guarantees are in the low 30s, but the running back market's the tougher one um, than, than anyone, any market. I just would not want to represent a running back. I know a lot of agents don't recruit running backs just because the shorter shelf life and then the second contract, um, the potential of getting what you should get is getting to be harder and harder um, as we go on. Giants Auto Podcast is brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants. From game day to every day, Citizens is made ready for Giant fans with insights, guidance, and solutions. Learn more at citizensbank.com. Joined by Joel Corey, former NFL agent from CBS Sports. You'll find it at cbssports.com, with all the stuff breaking down free agency. All right, Joel, let's, t- let's talk about some of the markets out there. The Giants, I think, have a big needed guard, and I think in order to try to get this offensive line squared away, I would not be surprised, and that they would target a uh, guy at the top of that market. What do you think the top of that market is going to look like when all is said and done and the top two or three guard contracts this offseason are handed out? Who do you think those guys are going to be, and what do you think the number is going to be around? Well, it depends on how high you want to go. If you're talking Kevin Dotson, Michael Wunu, that's a whole different category than anybody else. Um, Wunu's interesting because – He can play multiple positions. The position flexibility, uh, you could have to pay a premium for that. He has played left guard, right guard is where he settled in at 2022, but played right guard, played right tackle some as a rookie. Then they moved him back to right tackle last year. He'd rather be a right tackle from a payment standpoint because the highest paid right tackle, or the more right tackles who make more than – the higher paid guards. You got Quentin Nelson at 20 million, who sets the guard market, but you've got Juwan Taylor inexplicably is the highest paid right tackle, but you got several guys who are in the 18, 17 to $20 million range. You don't have that many uh, offensive guards in that range. So he's the most intriguing one um, to me. If you're going to go, for him, and maybe you're talking in that 17 to $20 million per year range is what he's going to want. Um, Kevin Dodson basically was going to be a cap casualty in Pittsburgh because they'd gone out and signed guards to replace him because he didn't really play that well in 2022. He's a uh, preseason trade to the Rams at the cut down. Doesn't start the first four games. It has a all-pro caliber year. He's going to be trying to get – 15, 16 million per year. I'd be, he's a kind of buyer beware for me because he was a penalty waiting to happen in 2022. No penalties in 2021. He flipped sides from the left to the right, uh, better suited for what he did on the right side. But those would be the two which would be way up there. Maybe if you're going more uh, affordable, you're looking at an Ezra Cleveland that got traded from Minnesota. To Jacksonville during the season, and he actually be... got extended a few minutes ago, Joel. So oh, he did? off the market. Yeah, I think about oh, okay. I think like I think like three for twenty-seven, something in that area for him. Okay, well, scratch that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about where it should be, or, or like a Dalton Risner who actually went to Minnesota and led to him being traded because um, he was an in-season signing. That's going to be probably six, seven million per year. You got John John Runyon might be in that same neighborhood as well. How about Robert or, Hunt? That's gonna be that's gonna be high territory. That's gonna be in that same neighborhood as the first two guys. He'll be uh, very expensive. So if you want to go hunting in that territory, so to speak, put no pun intended, then one of those three guys. <laughs> two other guys I'll throw at you that I think are interesting: Damian Lewis, twenty-seven year old from Seattle, more of a mauler type, and then Jonah Jackson, who I I, I liked when he came out of the draft. Two other guys that are both twenty-seven, you know, right in the middle of their prime. Are you looking in like the 10 to 12 area for those two guys, you think? Yeah, more so for Jackson. I, I think uh, Lewis might be more in the Cleveland range. Okay. But but still, uh, you need to upgrade your offensive line. Um, Evan Neal 
hasn't has been hasn't lived up to his draft position. So I assume you're bringing in a swing tackle as well. You're ready for a change. Payday comes early with citizens. So go to that retreat. New you moves to the country. Now you're raising goats and launching a lifestyle brand. Are you ready for all that life brings? Yeah, I want to go swing tackle next. You read my mind, Joel. And I think one guy that's interesting because the Giants hired Carmen Brasillo, who was the Raiders offensive line coach last year. And he had a lot of success with Jermaine Illuminor at right tackle for Las Vegas. I don't know if he's now a swing tackle because he kind of took over his starting job. Well, he's good question look- then. What what do you think his cost is going to be on the open market? Uh, Maybe 8 to 10 if he can get it. But he's going to look to start. He's not looking for swing tackle money. You, like your uh, Josh Jones's would be your swing tackles. To me, a guy that's probably going to end up being a swing tackle because I wouldn't pay him based on his injury history and what he didn't do last year was Makai Becton. I'm not paying him more than $5 million on a one. That's what your swing tackle market is. If you're talking like the older swing tackles, like a Cornelius Lewis, Cam Fleming, they should be cheaper. But if you're talking about a slightly younger, because he's 25, he has the most upside, but he's going to try to find a place to start. But I wouldn't. I wouldn't pay him. All right, the old last offensive position I want to touch with on here, Joel, is quarterback. The Giants have said they're going to add another quarterback this offseason, whether draft or free agency or both. Tyrod Taylor is a free agent. I'll throw some other vets out there. Ryan Tannehill, Gardner Minshew, Jacoby Brissett, Jameis Winston. What's the area for these guys if you're looking for a, a solid veteran backup quarterback? Well, here's the interesting thing to me. You'll know what the Giants' intentions are with Daniel Jones. I know that's Rich Eisen saying, reporting that they've given up on him. Well, they, they can get out of it next year and pick up like $19.3 million of cap space because he's got like a $41 million cap hit and like $22 million in dead money as long as they do it before the fifth day of the league year. So if you use a first or second round pick, and to me, I wouldn't use my first round pick. Number six, I think you need a – Top offensive weapon, Aroma Dunze or Malik Neighbors, maybe that should be your sixth pick. But if you're going quarterback, if someone drops or you take a quarterback six, that tells me everything you know about Daniel Jones or you use one of your two second-round picks. That tells me everything. If you're talking backup, you're talking Jacoby Brissett would probably be one of the more expensive ones. And maybe guys look at Daniel Jones as, hey, (laughs) he got overpaid. I I may be able to get on the field. Kind of like Ryan Tannehill with Marcus Mariota years ago where they traded for him. He ends up taking the job. Brissett's probably going to be like seven to nine on a one. Uh, Jameis Winston made four on a one last year. Mariota made five on a one last year. So you're probably talking four to six on a a one for most of those guys. Because I'd kind of look at the situation and go, this is not one where you can put in permanent ink, we got the starter. So there could be some vulnerability, but what they do in the draft will be very telling to me on how they feel about Daniel Jones. I know you talk to people on the league, Joel. I know you're not like a draft expert or whatever. What have you heard about J.J. McCarthy and about what the league thinks of him? Because I know a lot of Giant fans are assuming the top three guys are all going to be gone, right, by the time you get to six. But now a lot of Giant fans are jumping on the McCarthy bandwagon. In your discussions and talks, have you kind of picked up anything on him? Yeah, the, the league is higher on him than I would be just from watching him in Michigan and maybe because of the way the offense was run. I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I'd take him this high. We're in the top 10. Quarterbacks tend to get overdrafted anyway. So he's looking like he could be the fourth quarterback taken, and he could be available because one, two, the first three, obviously Caleb Williams, um, Heisman Trophy winner, Jane Daniels, and Drake May should be the first three then maybe Michael Penix could go in the first round, although he's got a significant injury history. But McCarthy has pretty much solidified himself as the fourth quarterback. Giant fans love a winner. It's why they love Citizens. They a 2022 best bank in the U.S. by The Banker. As the official bank of the Giants and sponsor of the huddle, Citizens is made ready for fans of Big Blue. Learn more at citizensbank.com. All right, Joel, let's jump over to the defensive side of the ball now. Giants have a bunch of needs here. Let's start at the edge spot, that defensive and outside linebacker edge rusher position. And I think it's pretty deep, to be honest with you. You know, it's a spot, Joel, where you have guys at the top of the market that are interesting. And then I think you have guys that you can get for less money that are interesting, too. But let's start at the top. And I think, for me at least, that would kind of be the Daniil Hunter, Bryce Huff area. 
Where do you think those guys will come in at when all is said and done? Oh, Hunter Huff, two different categories. Talking about a guy in Hunter that's been a starter for years. Mm-hmm. He's healthy, consistent, double-digit sack guy. If I represent Daniil Hunter, I grant, granted he's pushing 30. Uh, that's $25 million per year or more as he asks. Bryce Huff has been a situational pass rusher. He hadn't played more than 45% of the snaps in a year, so you're projecting him – to become a starter. But that being said, very effective when he's on the field. So I'm looking 15, 16 million per year if I'm him. That's what I'm trying to get. Uh, another guy along those lines that's situational pass rusher wasn't as effective last year, but in 2022, Josh Uche had to think 11, 11 and a half sacks. So that could be another way to go. Um, and well. he would be much cheaper, I would assume, too, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because the year he had last year, uh, that's a one year type prove a deal. Something that I expect to be a one-year prove a deal is Chase Young. He's probably looking at his former teammate, Montez Sweat, and what he got in Chicago at $24.5 million per year. I don't think anyone's paying him that. Um, not he, with his medicals, year, they're not. <laughs> yeah, he's got to he's stay healthy another year. He, he was the rookie, defensive rookie of the year, then the two injured years, fifth-year option I picked up, was healthy last year. Um, was trending towards double-digit sacks before the trade. Then playing time was cut in San Francisco. So last year you had an injured Marcus Davenport get like 13 on a one, which surprised me. So I wouldn't be surprised to see a similar type one-year deal for Chase Young because he's he, he's young as well, age-wise. And with that draft pedigree, he puts it together another year removed from all the injuries. Then he can go get his huge payday. I'll throw three vets at you. Clowney, Zadarius Smith, and Leonard Floyd, who have all been productive. Are these guys looking at one-year deals? Or do you think for a guy like Smith, who's been a little bit more consistent, he might be able to get a multi-year deal? Smith's a little bit older, or maybe maybe the same age as Clowney, but um, Clowney's a king of one-year deals. He's never had his – he's never gotten that huge payday. He got franchised by the Texans and then was traded to Seattle – Got the no franchise tag clause. They didn't tag him. He's been going one year deal ever since as a as a nomad. So he he resurrected himself in Baltimore. Um, signed for two and a half million plus incentives. He's probably going to go back to the eight to ten million where he was before. So Darius Smith wasn't happy in Minnesota after they signed um, Davenport. Got traded to Cleveland. Probably the same range. Leonard uh, Leonard Floyd also has done ones before. Still effective. They're all probably in that same range on a one-year deal. How about Davenport? Oh, he was hurt last year. So he was hurt in New Orleans most of the time. Um, The only reason Trey Hendrickson got paid was because Davenport was hurt because they Cam Jordan on the other side. So Trey Hendrickson took advantage of it, goes to uh, the Bengals, and has now gotten another extension. I'm not paying him more than $5 million plus a lot of sack and playtime incentives because I can't count on him. And I had five million. I want at least a million in per game roster. Bonuses. No, I think that makes sense. How about Jonathan Greenard? I think he's interesting. He's just 26 productive last year, hitting for agency, coming off a very good year at a good time for him. He scares me because year before he had one and a half sacks. Yep. So I'm like, who, who is the real guy? One and a half sacks or 12 and a half before he had the ankle injury at the end of the year. But he could, he's probably looking at 20, he's probably thinking 20 million per year or more based on what he did last year. But if I'm a team, I'm a little leery just because production wasn't there the year before. And a one hit wonders, uh, if I'm a team, I don't know if I want to be the one to buy a one, a one year wonder. No, I'm with you. We got some young vets at this position that have been in the league. Uh, come, some are coming off their rookie deal. I think Dorrance Armstrong is coming off an extension, but he's been a solid rotational guy for Dallas. Uh, you have uh, Andrew Van Ginkle, who had a pretty nice year in, in Miami. And then I'll throw AJ Epinesa kind of into that conversation as well, who's been okay coming out of Buffalo. Uh, what's the that kind of mid-level average type of pass rusher? Are we looking like the 7-9 to nine area for those yeah, guys? Yeah, you're, you're probably year? looking around that range, although – one or more of those guys may try to do a one thinking that if they can have a year where they put it all together, they'll do better next year. But yeah, they're, they're that next tier in terms of when you're starting to almost go bargain shopping for edge rushers. Cause, yeah. cause you pay edge rushers a premium. 
No, absolutely. Uh, because the on, first guy you pay is a quarterback. The next guy you pay is the guy who chases the quarterback. So, And then the next guy you pay is the guy that protects the quarterback. from. Yep, the guy that is true. <laughs> yep. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, Giants have a sneaky need, I think, for a pass rushing defensive tackle, Joel. I'm going to throw out, you know, the Christian Wilkins and the Leonard Williams of the world. I think they're going to make too much money. Uh, anybody in the middle of that market, a defensive tackle that you think could be a good value deal? I wouldn't th- wouldn't it be funny for Leonard Williams because what I understand what they did was they went to him and beforehand told him we're thinking about trading you but if you really don't want to go we won't necessarily do it so he felt real good about leaving um, if he's decided I've made money and I don't necessarily need every last dollar because I think if he's deciding I've made money he wants the same is the last contract, although he's older. If he's got some flexibility, wouldn't it be something if you picked up a second round pick, which to me was you put on a ski mask and stole from Seattle because you shouldn't have gotten more for him than what you gave up, what you had to give up to get him when he was younger. To me, that was mind boggling. So wouldn't it be something if somehow that worked out? But um I'm not sure who you'd get really going for an interior defensive lineman um, like that. Maybe a guy who can play inside, outside, who has a little familiarity with the defense would be Danico uh, Autry. And the reason why I say that is familiarity brings comfort. And Shane Bowen comes from Tennessee. Autry can play both inside, outside. Comes from the Titans. I'd look for guys who were on the Titans who know the defense to potentially be candidates to be Giants or guys that Joe Shane um, had that were there when he was the assistant GM to potentially be on the radar screen of the Giants. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons I mentioned AJ Epinesa, one of the guys they drafted while he was there. You love turf. You're good at it. So you start a turf biz. Business grows. Your savings grow. Become the most celebrated name in turf. Are you ready for all that life brings? All right, let's go to corner. And a couple of those Titan players are at corner, Joel, so you can hit on those if you want. But let's separate this into slot and outside because I do think they're almost two distinct positions at this point. Yes. Let, let's start with the slot guys first because I feel like you get really good value at, at slot corner and for Asia. Yeah, they don't get paid like the outside guys. They don't at all. Yeah, and you can get a really good player for like a way well under ten million a year that can start and yes. be good for you. So guys like Kenny Moore, I think is a that's nice the first guy kid. that was in my head was Kenny Moore and Jordan mm-hmm. Lewis, another guy from Dallas. I know he had some injury issues, but he's been good in, for Dallas in the slot for a long time. Uh, those two guys, what do you think the cost would be? And then any other slot guys kind of jump out at you? Yeah, those two are the ones that really are on my radar screen. You're really talking no more than ten million per year, less for for uh, Lewis because he's been hurt, but. Uh, Alluding to the Tennessee guys, uh, yeah, Sean uh, Murphy Bunting, probably no more than $5 million on a one. And Christian Fulton, who was perpetually injured, has a lot of potential. He could be a steal if healthy. Sometimes it works the other way, that if you know somebody, you don't want anything to do with them. <laughs> but typically you see a lot of guys – and I'll go back to a long time, a long time ago with the Giants. I used to call the Giants the New, the New Jersey Broncos because of Dan Reeves, because all those Denver guys started coming over. And that kind of got on my radar screen. And Parcells did that as well. He took former Giants wherever he went. But yeah, Christian Fulton has a lot of upside. It should be extremely cheap, probably no more than three, four million on a one. But here, here's what I keep an eye on. Um, all pro corner has injuries past couple of years, rehabbing an Achilles, just got released. Joe Shane knows Tredavious White. He's going to be much cheaper than he'd ever be. And that screams one year deal. I don't, he is a risk because of all the injuries. He hasn't had a healthy season since really 2020 because he got hurt in 2021 toward the ACL, came back late in 2022 toward the Achilles early this year, but he's been a high-quality corner. Yeah, I think that's an interesting name. Two guys that I think would I would consider towards the top of the class, but they're not Pro Bowl corners, but they're good players, are Kendall Fuller and Shadobi Awuzie. 
They're both kind of older, you know, mid-range veterans, 28, 29 years old. They're both outside cornerbacks. The Giants might need an outside corner if Adore Jackson does not return. What do you think? You're looking at 15 million per for those two guys, you think, in that area? Uh, you're going to be over 10. You may not get to 15, but yeah, over 10. Yeah, definitely. If you want to go that high. You guys, do, you do have more cap space than than you've had in some previous years. So you could go out and have some make – you could go out and get a big ticket item. Yeah, absolutely. I think you could probably do it at two positions, to be honest with you, if you wanted to shoot. Yeah, you're probably right. You probably could. And, you know, I'm thinking kind of guard and edge. I think those are the two spots that I think they probably the biggest – Well, you may have a sneaky need um, where it's not a great – it's not the same year it was last year in the draft. And you saw the top tight end uh, go off the market in Dalton Schultz because Waller's contemplating retirement. Yeah. Yeah, so and, that, and I think there are some decent players there too, right? Hunter Henry, I don't know how much these guys are going to go for, though. Yeah, he's a little older, and I've heard that New England wants him back. And he's probably thinking, I don't need to take a pay cut. I'm like, yeah, you do. You haven't been all that productive. You weren't really that much more productive than John Smith when they inexplicably signed both of them in 2021 for nearly identical $12.5 million per year deals. Johnny took a pay cut to $7.5 million per year last year to go to Atlanta and then got released. Then Noah Fant, who has that first-round pedigree, um, was in a weird timeshare in Seattle with Will Disley and um, Kobe Parkinson, so the stats aren't there. His best year statistically were in Denver. He might be the best young guy out there. All right, so let's wrap up here with with safety. We talked about it in relation to McKinney, right? I'm just going to throw out all these names. I mean, we talked about some of them already, but guys, we didn't. Geno Stone, Jordan Fuller, Jordan Whitehead, C.J. Gardner-Johnson is also more of a nickel, right? Deshaun Elliott, Darnell Savage. Then you have the veterans that Taylor Rapp just re-signed. The veterans, Eddie Jackson, Poyer, Micah High, Quandre Diggs, uh, Justin Simmons. I mean, with all these safeties... Joel, I got to imagine you're going to be able to find a pretty good starting. Oh yeah, you're, like, yeah, like, it's like definitely five or six a, million a year, right? Like it's a buyer's market, and we saw Rap sign what was reported as a three-year deal worth up to fourteen point five million. I'm not going to fall for the Mike Evans reporting. <laughs> so up to fourteen point five million over three years means that's the max value. I don't know what the base value is. But it certainly isn't what, what would that be like four or five a year or or four point seven five a year. It's definitely not that is the base value. But yeah, you got so many guys out there, some of them a little bit older, but you're gonna be able to find at least a guy that has played at a high level, maybe still can't play at what he the level he used to at a pretty good price. Like you got the two bill safeties, Micah Hyde, who's free poyer that was released, they're older. So they're going to be probably no more than six million, I would think. Um, and Joe Shane knows those two guys, but yeah, there are a ton of safeties out there. All right, and then I want to touch on two running backs we didn't mention earlier that I think are interesting because they have connections to the Giants, and that's Zach Moss and Devin Singletary. Right? You mentioned guys that Joe Shane knew from Buffalo. They were both yep. there in Buffalo when Joe Shane was there. Both had pretty good years last year, but again, saturated market five, one, like one for you five. May, you may there? you may not have to go there. Wow. Um, Zach Moss was interesting to me because when Jonathan Taylor was out, it was like, do you really need Jonathan Taylor? Because <laughs> he was one of the league leaders in, in rushing. And, and then when Taylor, Taylor came back, they were splitting carries 50 Yeah, initially until crazy. Taylor got up to speed. And you, I could see that one if Saquon's gone. Uh, single Singletary took that job from Damian Pierce. I know it was a regime change down there, but he was having almost a thousand yard back as a rookie before he got hurt. Um, so yeah, one of those two guys potentially, and they're not going to be expensive. Uh, you've got so many guys out there, Austin Eckler, um, older, who's more of a pass catching back. I already said Derrick Henry, DeAndre Smith, Tony Pollard. So yeah, you've got a glut of running backs, not quite to the degree of the number of safeties you now have, but still, um, it's definitely going to be a buyer's market for those two positions, not a seller's market. Yeah, and then and you have some bangers too, right? Like Gus Edwards, A.J. Dillon, Dante Foreman. Like these are guys that have had yeah. success in this league. And like you want to – you could put one of those guys with either like a Singletary and Moss and probably be at like seven and a half, eight million million, $8 million between the two contracts. And yep, you feel that's pretty true. good that, about that. 
Yeah, so you can definitely go out and find a way to replace Saquon and with with two backs and you'll probably replicate his production. <laughs> All right, Joel, let's wrap up here. I'll ask you a very broad question. What's one thing that you think that you expect will happen that you think might surprise people when free agency opens next week? What are the things that you're really trying to keep an eye on? And then what's one thing that might surprise people? Um, I'm curious to see first where these quarterbacks go. I mean, at the top, the the high end one, Baker Mayfield, how much does he get? off of resurrecting his career. I'm if I'm him, I'm looking at this Daniel Jones contract and going, hey, he gets 40. They didn't pick him his fifth year option. I want 40 if I'm the team. I'm like, you're more like Geno Smith. That's 25 with upside to 35. Then you got the Dolphins, are they going to get two a done? That'll be over 50 if it gets done. Garrett Goff is someone that has a second day of the league year roster bonus. He's proven that he's not just a product of Sean McVay's system. That'll probably be over 50. Then the big one is Dak Prescott. If I'm Dak Prescott, I'd pull a page out of Russell Wilson's book from 2019. I've got an almost $59.5 million cap hit and no trade clause, and you can't stick a franchise tag on me if I play out my contract. Russell reportedly – told the Seahawks in 2019, we have a deal done by X date or we never negotiate again when he was going through his contract year when they made him the highest paid player in the league. I know Dak didn't play well against Green Bay, but he was the NFL MVP runner up. I'd tell Jerry, if if I'm Todd France, if Jerry, if Dak would allow me to do it, here, we're done by this date. It's got to be X. If not, you you can find yourself a quarterback next year. I'd stick a gun to his head. Yeah, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, I don't really understand what Dallas' strategy is here, right? I mean, they waited so long to get the last contract done. To your point, they can't tag him right now, and and you can't. And he also has no trade clause, right? It's not like you can go and yeah. trade him for picks if you want. So he's a sixty million dollar number. The yeah. Cowboys, I still think, as of this recording on on Thursday at one o'clock, Dallas is still over the cap. Like, yeah, they are. They, they are compliant yet. So well, they they can get compliant with him, and if they do this, to me, that means they're not close on a negotiation. They've got two voting dummy years already in the contract, so they've got automatic conversion rights in the in the in the contract. So they could kick the can down the road, and they pick up almost twenty two million in cap space that way. But they can't use the roster bonus um, if they do get a deal done. They can still use his base salary, but not the roster bonus. But then let's say they don't get anything done. Then they have $58 million of dead money next year. So uh, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. There just seems to be no urgency there, which to me is, is shocking. I, I, it, it, it's just very odd the way they're handling it to me. I don't know. Yeah, well, how he handled it the first time was just as odd because the reason you're in this position is you, one, didn't do it early when he was going into his contract year. Two, you made him play on a franchise tag. You created unnecessary conditions which may have created some acrimony and you had to make all these concessions to get a deal done. So that's their own fault. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, look, Jive fans, great. I mean, the more turmoil there is in Dallas, the better it is for the people in this building, the happier we all are. Uh, and then the one thing you didn't mention is Kirk Cousins. I mean, isn't he kind of the linchpin? And, and where he goes is going to impact the draft too because it seems to be Atlanta, Minnesota. You know, I think other teams could be in the mix too, but if a team doesn't get Cousins, then all of a sudden they've got to be all in on a quarterback in the draft, right? Yeah, that's true. Or maybe let's say Atlanta, let's say Cousins goes back to Minnesota. Does that put Justin Fields in play for Atlanta if they don't draft somebody? But Cousins was playing the best football of his career before he tore his Achilles. They they have an interesting, what should be urgency for them, his contract voids the last day of the league year. They have these voiding dummy years in his contract where there's going to be $28.5 million of dead money as opposed to $10.25 million of bonus proration right now counting in 2024. If they don't get a deal done, it expires. So if they get a deal done before the end of the league year, the bonus proration for his 24, 25, 26, and 27 years remains intact, kind of like the Saints used to have Drew Brees. But if not, it's $28.5 million in dead money. Then they'd have to go out and re-sign him if they did. I suspect that he's going to be at least $40 million per year. If you take the $35 million 
which was his last extension in 2022, adjusted for cap inflation, you're at 43. And then you mentioned Justin Fields, and I promise this is the last follow-up. I can't believe with all these quarterback desperate teams that we talked about with running back and safety, how there's more guys circling the chairs than there are chairs. It's the opposite with quarterback, right? There's only a couple yeah. guys walking around a whole bunch of chairs that teams want to fill. I can't believe there's not a team out there willing to give up a second-round pick. For, I'm not the biggest Justin Fields guy. I think he's a good quarterback. I don't think he's great. But if you're a team like the Steelers even, like a mid, mid to late second-round pick's not worth to roll the dice on a quarterback like Fields, that confuses me a little bit, to be honest with you. Well, if I'm the Bears, I'm looking at the Sam Bradford compensation when the Jets were drafting Zach Wilson. He went to – Carolina, and then they end up trading for Baker Mayfield the same year. They gave up a second and I think a fourth and another pick. So I'm kind of looking at that as the baseline. Then you got the, the really intriguing one of Russell Wilson. He's got $39 million fully guaranteed of an offset that he's going to get from Denver. So he can, play, he can go someplace and play for league minimum. Right. Uh, you can say what you want about Russell Wilson. If you can get a quarterback who could start for a, a $1.21 million base salary, that makes him a whole lot more attractive to – to teams because he's not going to do Denver any favors. The more money he makes, the more they get off the hook from the $39 million with the offset. So he's going to sign for minimum or next to it. That could make him attractive to somebody to come in and be a bridge starter. Um, I mean, maybe draft someone like the Raiders, draft a quarterback, have him come in for a year. He gets a chance to try to resurrect himself and then go elsewhere since he says he wants to be on the Tom Brady plane and play as long as he can. All right, Joel, tell the folks uh, where they can find your work and anything else you want them to know about that you're up to. Yeah, you can find me on X at Corey Joel. That's C-O-R-R-Y-J-O-E-L. I have a piece out right now on 10 intriguing offensive players who are the franchise or will be unrestricted, and I set target prices for them. Although when people read the article, they go, this is the projection. I'm like, no, it's not the projection. It's what I would be looking to get if I represented the guy, what you ask for and what you get aren't necessarily the same thing. And you ask for more than you think you might get. Because in Saquon's case, I'm like, if I can get what I got last year, what I had added for 11 million per year, 20 million fully guaranteed signing, 23 in overall guarantees on a three year deal. I don't think he's going to get that. That's what I'd be asking for. And tomorrow, defensive players come out. Well, that'll be awesome. And this is going up on Friday. So both those should be up. By the time uh, you guys watch and listen to this on the Giants Huddle Podcast, Joe, I love talking to you, man. You're the best. Thanks so much, and uh, let's stay in touch and enjoy the chaos of the next ten days or so. Oh yeah, definitely will. Definitely will. All right, Joe Corey and the Giants Huddle Podcast brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants. We'll see you next time, everybody. Enjoy your weekend, and the chaos starts next week.